So welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I'm delighted to launch a new series today. Uh, we have Chase and Alex with us, uh, and it's going to be, they have been working on a podcast called The Switch. So I'm going to be interviewing them about the idea of the switch. So this is kind of a switcheroo. Normally they interview people. So this time I'll be interviewing them. So with that, uh, Chase and Alex, can you talk a little bit about the idea of the switch and why the switch? Yeah, um, if you want, we can just, I can just tell you some of the story of to like how it came to be. Please, please, I think wonderful. That, that may be the best way to illustrate what the switch is about. So Alex and I went to college together. Um, we lived together with another roommate for three years in college. And um, we straight out of college started a business together doing um, audio design for video games, uh, music, sound design, audio implementation. And um, somewhere along our college journey, uh, we had connected in the world of philosophy. You know, we were both big readers. We loved uh, reading various people's ideas and talking ideas. And we, uh, we were, I think I specifically remember where we were in a specific restaurant, but we were talking about uh, starting a podcast. We basically had this idea that, you know, these conversations that we were having were, uh, the kinds of things that we were hearing on podcasts we were listening to, and we thought that we could help facilitate productive discussion. So we were saying, oh yeah, well, wouldn't it be cool to start a podcast? And we actually uh, talked to our friend Christian about it, who has his own podcast, and his advice right off the bat was don't. It's not worth it. It's too much trouble. Um, it, you know, Marketing for it is gonna be hard, and it's gonna be like to get any return on it, um, you're going to have to work harder than you think. And it's just not worth it. Like go do things that you're already good at and training for and things like that. Uh, and so we tabled it until about two, three years ago. I can't remember exactly. How, yeah, I think it was about three years ago, two years ago, we came back to it and we said, look, we've got what we need resource wise to get this thing started. We just have to solidify an idea. We have to solidify like when people say, what is your podcast about? We have to have like a one-liner that we can give them. And we know in our minds, whatever we come up with there kind of has to be a little bit of an excuse to just talk about the things we want to talk about. Because like I said, it, it all comes down to this foundation of we're interested in ideas. We're interested in, you know, talking about the world and facilitating conversation about interesting things. And so we sort of mulled it over for a little bit and we came up with this tagline where we are exploring ideas uh, that have the capacity to change your mind, right? Ideas and experiences that influence you in some way and cause whatever, you know, whatever the reason, cause that switch to flip where you used to think about things one way and now you think about things another. Um, and uh, you know, I, I remember we had had conversations about that particular idea. Um, I think the first one that we talked about was free will. We had both read Sam Harris's book, free will. And like, you, whether you buy his argument or not, just reading through it totally changes the way that you think about things in the world. If you were not already in that, that, um, uh, that mind space or that the first time you read about anything, um, in the sort of determinism space, it, it changes how you think about things in the world and it flips a switch in your brain that like, unless you, I don't know, ignore it for a long time, doesn't get switched back off. It totally changes the way that you think about things. So we came up with that as our tagline and we started contacting people and um, we've done about 15 episodes a year since then where we go and interview people that we think are interesting and have interesting things to, to talk about. But we really focus on, you know, how do these ideas that, that you're talking about change your mind about the way you think about the world? Um, 
Sometimes that's in the form of stories and how people got to their ideas. Sometimes that's in the form of discoveries. Sometimes it's over time. Sometimes it's stories about how our interviewees' ideas changed our perspectives on the world. But the point is focusing on, on that uh, ability to change perspective and modeling sort of epistemic openness. That's my answer. Alex, I don't know if you want to pick up on any of that. I think, you know, philosophically that hits everything. And, you know, I think it was originally really Chase's brainchild. I think Chase more actively seeks out, um, you know, new ideas than I do. I, I'm just as interested in them probably, but he has a certain uh, tenacity and in, in seeking them out. But um, basically I also wanted to do it as a means for personal growth too. You know, it's, just talking to people, interviewing people, thinking quickly on my feet is something I've always struggled with. So I was like, yeah, I'll do the thing that I'm nervous about and get anxiety about before I do it. And I feel like I've gotten a lot better with that and learned about a lot of different people, you know, and a lot of different switches. And, you know, as I'm sure we'll talk about at some point during this, like my whole, I'd say almost my physical or intuitive reaction to new information is different at this point i think than it was before we started this whole process so let's go more into this idea of switch so for either of you uh you talked about uh, chase you ended by saying epistemic openness uh what say a little bit more about epistemic openness and how it connects to the idea of switch. Yeah, so uh, when I say epistemic open. Sorry, my mistake. No problem. My mistake, I was trying um, to mute when myself. I say, when I say epistemic openness, what I really mean is uh, I try to embody an epistemology, meaning like a, a stance toward uh, the discovery of knowledge where I do my best to not hold any ideas at either 100% or 0% confidence. I always try to leave that 1% room on either end, whether I think something is totally not true or totally true. I always try to leave that 1% off the end of my sort of confidence scale so that if there is sufficient evidence, it's got a place to drive a wedge and tip me to the other end. The idea being, if I'm totally wrong about something, however confident I might be, I want to make sure that I, I still have the ability to flip to the, the right side of things. Uh, so that's what I mean when I say epistemic openness. Okay. Uh, what I want to do is I want to uh, broaden the conversation a little bit um, in terms of your involvement with the meetup. And so talk a little bit about your discovery of this meetup and what it was like and how, uh, how it applies to this idea of epistemic openness. Sure, so um, the way I discovered the meetup was in late 2017. Um, there was, I don't know if I should name the, the other meetup that led to this, but anyway, uh, a friend of mine had signed up for this debate with another meetup in New York City. And he said, hey, you know, Chase, we talk about these things. It was a political debate. He was like, let's, I'm just going to sign us up for this debate. We'll debate together and we'll be on the same team. And then, you know, we'll debate against these other people. And we went into it and almost immediately he dropped out, um, which, you know, I'm sure he had other things going on. He had good reasons, but he dropped out, but I was still signed up. And so they filled in with the rest of the, the volunteers uh, you know, debate partners and things. And somehow I ended up with Shrikant as my debate partner. And we were debating, uh, the motion was something like, um, the cost of higher tuition is worth, is worth it, or something like that. Um, and anyway, uh, to make it a little bit shorter, um, Shrikant told me about this meetup that he ran at the time it was called 103 living idea or 103 great ideas. Um, and you know, every, every Saturday he would meet in a public space with a bunch of people. Um, and the first couple of times I went, there were maybe 10, 12 people there. And it, it was the same group of people pretty much every time. So it was a, a good group of regulars, people who were, you know, 
deep thinkers interested in ideas. And um, within a couple of weeks, a couple of months, we had sort of uh, been talking about ideas, the debate had uh, come and gone, and I started going to Shri Khan's meetup. And I don't exactly remember how I ended up helping you organize uh, you know, topics and helping facilitate the meetup, but just through our regular conversations and my ideas about, you know, how we could move things forward and how we could organize things, the meetup started to grow and we ended up with this awesome group of people who are super interested in ideas and great thinkers. And, you know, I've made so many awesome friends from this meetup and we were meeting every Saturday in New York city and like, Sometimes it would just be, you know, the core group of 10, 15, 20 people. And then some of these meetups would be 80 people. And it would be just just great chaos of like a whole bunch of people trying to weigh in on ideas and meet in different formats. Uh, but it was always worth it. It was always great to go because what we were doing was this exploration of ideas. We were seeking out uh, new ideas that had the possibility of changing the way you think about things. I mean, that's why you seek new ideas. And so, yeah, it took off okay. from there. Okay, um, so let's talk about uh, the uh, first, first thing I want to ask. I know that this is a very difficult question because when you work on something, everything, all that you make are your children. But can you talk about some of the favorite uh, you know, some of the kind of core things that you learned uh, while doing these meetups. Uh, so one or two for you and one or two for Alex. So people get an idea of what this idea of switch is and what kind of things are we talking about? Sure. Um, it, wait, favorite topics from the meetups or the podcast? No, from the podcast, from, okay. from, from switch. I mean, yeah. give me examples of some switches that sure. you found uh, particularly useful to you? Sure. Uh, so to be a little bit transparent, um, most of the actual switches didn't happen during the recording process. They would usually happen during the research phase. So we would find guests that had interesting ideas that we knew we wanted to interview. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't sound like an idiot asking questions to these people who especially if it was somebody that i like had great respect for and they were like deep in their field i didn't want to sound like a complete idiot so i would go and do a bunch of research so for example when we talked to john azariah from microsoft research on quantum computing like i spent a whole week watching youtube lectures on quantum mechanics and quantum computing and trying to just understand the bare bones basics of what the heck does that mean quantum computer so that I could ask him the right questions of the things that I was interested in and you know be able to frame things in terms that he already understood be able to contextualize things especially you know a lot of our guests if they're deep in their fields they'll they'll bring up heavy topics and they're so used to talking with people that understand these things at a deep level they'll forget to to do some of the foundational work to get people up to speed so if I just spent the last week doing that, I can slow people down. I can ask the right, ask the right questions to keep the listeners uh, on board. So back to the switch that I had with quantum computing, I had absolutely no understanding of this technology other than the fact that you know people were saying, oh, quantum computing is, is a cool big thing. But through researching, uh, doing the research on that topic and being able to talk to John about those topics, my understanding of some of the most fundamental particles of the universe completely changed. I did not understand that, that, that those phenomena that we observe, that we now call quantum mechanics, existed at all in that level. Like I had heard a little bit about it before, but like that was a complete switch for me. One of the ones for me was in our podcast with Ann Curzan who's a professor um, that researches language. And so my mom was an English teacher. So I grew up, you know, very like, make sure your grammar's right. And, you know, the typical, like a child of an English teacher type, you know, rules. And then this, you know, uh, professor 
is talking about basically not judging other types of use of the English language, you know, like other sections of the language that have basically diverged from, you know, standard American English and developed into their own little realms and how they are not incorrect in lots of, in a lot of ways and that they have their own like uh, merits and usefulness. And that just kind of blew my mind realizing that I had had a right version of thinking about the use of the English language and thinking, you know, the way that I write essays is just right. And everything else is varying degrees of incorrect. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to talk about um, is, so uh, can you just give, I mean, the, the, in terms of people that you interview, um, how do you choose them? What's, uh, what kind of people are you interested in interviewing? How, how, how do you go about that? And what, what's, what's your criteria of selection? Alex, do you want to go first on this one? It's up to you. So, so this is one of the perks of having a theme as the thing that holds it together instead of a topic is we can kind of bend that to justify just anybody we want to talk to. So if, um, uh, if, so if it's somebody that we, you know, I feel like we've learned a lot from and, and continue to want to learn more, but have kind of finished consuming their content and have our own questions, I'd say that's the most natural um, guest to invite because we already have our questions, you know, listed. We already, um, we, and we might have things that they haven't answered on other podcasts, you know, like uh, the next level because we we're a big fan of theirs. So for me, like, especially with um, the Secular Buddhism podcast, I listened to every single episode and I was just was really fascinated with his take, Noah Roshetta, on, um, you know, Buddhism and, and mindfulness. And I had already had a lot of questions and just even personal questions that I wanted to ask him because I valued his take on everything. So in my opinion, that's what I valued. So yeah. go ahead. Chase. So my, my quick answer was going to be, we take anybody who answers our emails, but my real answer uh, is just like Alex said, anybody who I feel like I've learned from or that I've, uh, you know, yeah, anybody that I've learned from. So, we, I mean, we've had everybody from YouTubers that I've watched to, uh, you know, scientists that we've found their, their work interesting. We've had uh, an entrepreneur or two. And uh, we had my high school philosophy teacher. We had a couple of Goruk cadre, these retired special operations guys who I had had real life experiences with through Goruk. Uh, and they had taught me things there. And I wanted to be able to like distill that into podcast format. So anybody who strikes us like that, we, we do our best to try to get them on and talk to them. Okay. So basically you choose people that you are interested in. You know, if they have done some interesting work, you want to talk to them. So now, how? So now, how? When you ask them the question, what transformed your life? Do you find that that's a difficult question for them, or they just kind of say uh, they have many things? There is, they have just like one or two things. What What's the general pattern of reaction to the question of what transformed your way of thinking or way of life? There's definitely an art to, to asking that. Um, I don't want to give away our secrets. No, I'm, I'm kidding. It's, it's not a secret. Uh, usually we ask people to start by telling their story, which contextualizes their life in terms of where they are now and where they used to be. And often people naturally, in even just telling a 10 or 15 minute version of their life story, they'll naturally hit points of change where we can then zoom in and say, Oh, well, when you when you left college to join the army, like, what did your parents think? What did you think when you first joined? Like, how was boot camp? What were you thinking? When did you meet your first good leader? Like, if, you know, things like that. And people naturally hit those points. But it, it definitely, sometimes it's difficult to drill down. And then we'll just hit the topic and 
go deep into the subject and you know you can from there you can sort of peel back and find the the transformational points i think people naturally hit those things and i think also like chase um alluded to like kind of delving into the emotions that they have surrounding those moments you know when they when they when would they lead up to it in their story um because you know we could a lot of us could say intellectually like here's the numbers that changed my mind but i feel like a lot of switches end up being you know very very emotional you know especially to big things in people's lives and things that they add to their life story so i think trying to drill down on that and and focus on how they felt in that time and how it changed their emotions in you know thereafter i think that to me is is something i want to hit usually Oh, that's excellent. So let's, let's do a switcheroo here. So Alex, tell me your story uh, of your life and tell me what were the switch points in that story. So I grew up in upstate New York in a very rural town. Um, my parents were teachers. There's, my nearest neighbor was probably a mile away. So very isolated, only child, and just had to find ways to entertain myself. So I would play with Legos all the time, play video games all the time, always something creative, always something building, and always something that I could always move on to the next thing, kind of a train of thought of uh, exploration or creativity. And I was always super bored throughout school, and I would continuously latch on to new um, disciplines or hobbies. I might go super hard in track and field for two years and then just forget about it and then learn to play guitar and just focus on that for a few years and get as good as I could and then move on. And a lot of these things would, would be dropped along the way. You know, I'd learn it, get okay at it or decent at it, and then move on because my interest shifted. So towards the end of high school, I started lifting weights. And that was the first time when I feel like I really stuck with something that didn't come naturally to me and it was difficult for me. And it kind of was the first thing I think that taught me discipline because up till then in my small town, I was able to kind of just get through pretty easily, just do one thing, go to the next and never have to stick to anything that was difficult. So I feel like that was a skill I was really missing when I was right about to go to college. So I started building that skill then. And then I went to music school where, again, you're focusing on one thing, very disciplined about it. But it was really that kind of convergence of the weightlifting and the music. So they both allowed themselves, or they both allowed me to express myself in different ways and meet different people. So with the weightlifting people, I met a lot of uh, a diverse set of people philosophically, you know, what they like to do, how they operated in life, but we had a shared interest. And the the same thing in the music but they were very different groups of people and i felt like i needed both i didn't feel like i ever really belonged in any group and i always felt really uncomfortable when i was getting kind of in my opinion like pigeonholed into one group it felt like it restrained that kind of free-flowing creativity that i had had throughout my whole life and just freedom basically um so go through college basically i become good friends with chase we're roommates start a business together doing video game audio and yeah i've had yeah actually i missed a big part, point um so i had always had a lot of extreme anxiety throughout my life and midway through college i kind of hit the 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 point where i couldn't start to get things done you know it's like i'm too anxious to get that first step and eventually after trying a few things i just happened to pick up a book mindfulness in plain English. And I would think I was just at the right time and the right place to absorb its message. I think if I had uh, read it in high school, I would have been totally disinterested. But because I was in a vulnerable place, I was in the place I needed to be to hear that. So I think that's a big theme in my life is that I rely heavily on just what's happening to me and my intuition. And I just kind of go with it and try not to resist it or reject it. So as new opportunities and new things come along, I try to assess, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? And that's led me to where I am now, where Chase and I are still working together. Um, I did a stint in real estate 
I do it a little bit now, but my primary thing as I've, you know, uh, moved away and came back to is music, writing music. And that's the thing that I feel like I've been able to incorporate discipline and, you know, uh, love and passion into. So I'm doing that. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alex. Chase, what about you? What, what's your story? And what have been the transforming points for you? Oh, boy. Um, yeah, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, with awesome parents who are listening. Uh, so, you know, I don't know how much of my story I can tell. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and it's, it's an awesome place to grow up because you get exposed to everything. Uh, it's this little college town in Michigan where, you know, cultures intersect and you have a, a mix of new and old. And I grew up eating all kinds of food and hearing all kinds of music. And, you know, I had awesome teachers. And I think that that sort of worldly experience, it's like a, like that little town has little slices of everywhere in the world. Um, I feel like that, you know, rainbow of experience sort of helped me remain open to ideas throughout my life. Um, my story in college is somewhat similar to Alex's in terms of like, I, I had a lot of issues with anxiety. And uh, after Alex read that meditation book, he, he was telling me about it. And that was the catalyst for me to read it and start meditating because you know, I saw the effect that it had on him. We actually have an episode. This is our very first episode of the switch is about this particular subject. Uh, but to make it the short version, uh, he said, Oh, I'm, I'm not feeling bored anymore. Like there's always stuff to pay attention to. And I said, I hate being bored. That sounds great. Let me read this thing. So I don't ever have to be bored again. And you know, that's, that's a side effect of when you first start meditating. It's not like you can never feel boredom again, but it does help you pay attention to what boredom is. Um, jumping around a little bit, but philosophically, uh, the other major turning point in my life that I can identify goes back to high school. Um, I, I had an awesome school experience, kindergarten through eighth grade, and then I went to public high school and I just didn't, it didn't fit. It didn't work for me. I hated it. Uh, I struggled through it. I tried all sorts of different things. Uh, I did football for a year, stopped that. I did theater a little bit. I liked that, but you know, still here and there. Um, and in my senior year of high school, I took a philosophy class and it just blew my mind. And just that the whole exposure to the world of philosophy in this intro to philosophy class as a high school senior completely changed uh, for permanently uh, the way that I look at life. And I know that it's, it's a so far permanent change because our season two opener was with my high school philosophy teacher and I had no idea he was going to do this. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't ruin the episode. Uh, if you're going to go back and listen to this episode, plug your ears. Uh, he pulled out a paper that I had written, a little little one-page essay that I had written that I totally forgot that I had written. It was and it was a like, "Who am I? Describe yourself" type of thing. And the very first line is, "I am a discoverer." And I had no idea. I had probably written that in high school, and then that had never crossed my mind that I had written that until we were recording, doing the podcast, and he goes, hey, I have this thing, can I read it to you? And I was just like, wow. Like the impact that philosophy and the pursuit of understanding in the world has had on me is like, that defines my life. That's who I am. So those are, those are some major turning points. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, I just want to let uh, everybody know that I'm going to be on the other side uh, next Monday, uh, where Chase is going to be asking me similar questions. So I wanted to, I wanted to know what it's like. Uh, so um, 
So let's talk more about this epistemic openness or kind of focusing on the next thing or kind of transformation. Most people are people are creatures of habit about most things, about the ideas that they hold, what they do, the people around them. Um, and they carry on like that most of the time. Uh, this approach, whether it is, you know, kind of, we talk about it in terms of Carol Dweck's terminology of fixed mindset versus growth mindset. Um, or we can talk about it in terms of uh, Daniel Kahneman's terminology of most people using system one most of the time and not engaging the system two. Um, so why, you know, when you, when you look at, you know, you looked at several people and they've talked to you about their transformation points. Um, why is it that most people are as resistant to change and continuing to go with what it is? And what does it take to be actually open to making a radical transformation of your thought, of your emotions, of your, of your life? I think part of it is just being aware what your beliefs are tied to emotionally within yourself and what, or your identity. Because those are the things I think people tend to hold on to the most. Like for me, when I was growing up, I, I had heard this story this one time when I was learning to play guitar, right? And I, was, I saw this professional guitarist and he was told a story in the middle of the concert about how uh, this young player came up to him and said like, I wish I had a better guitar. I can't play like you because I have this crappy guitar. And he said, do you mind if I take a look at it? And he picked up the guitar and just made it sound incredible and then handed it back to the kid and basically said, you know, it's not the instrument. A great musician can make anything sound good. And I remember I was basically in that exact position of that kid in that moment. And I had been already incorporated into my identity that I was a great guitarist. And anything that kind of uh, attacked that seemed like like that an attack um so i was always looking for ways to avoid thinking that and let's see how many years did it take me to to realize that i don't know but um it's you know in a in thinking about the emotions that are tied to it like i, I started out saying i think if you can become aware of that that's the first step to be being able to change things because if if they're tied to these things in your past or things ideas about your identity you know you might not be able to change it if it's so you know core to who you are that's that's excellent uh, i mean i think there is this uh, progression i think um, of unconscious incompetence to towards conscious competence uh no un unconscious competence uh you know going from unconscious incompetence, not even knowing that you can't do something, to becoming conscious of your incompetence. That takes a lot of courage to go to that step. And then the next step is that of kind of conscious competence where painstakingly, effortfully, and in a determined way, you rewire your circuits, rewire the way you're doing things up to a point where you reach kind of unconscious uh, competence where it becomes now a part of you and then that becomes the new normal so I, I think that's that's very beautiful and i think um also kind of how i think about it now is eventually once i admitted that i realized this is the only way to actually get to be who i want to be so once i realized that and accepted that i was able to move past it and once i realized that in one field i feel like i've been much more able to transfer it to other fields and as long as we continue to practice it. And that was part of the point of the whole podcast. Wow. Uh, Chase, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think that the, the identity point is worth uh, reinforcing. Um, anybody who's, you know, dived deep into Jordan Peterson knows he, he's got this interesting graphic about identity. And he talks about how when things go wrong in life, you know, from an outside perspective, if you make a mistake, it may affect your local role or identity in a particular situation. So, you know, you, you cook a bad meal. All that says about you is that, well, you need to brush up on your kitchen skills. 
But in your mind, if, if you've got some, some high stakes on this meal, stakes was not an intentional pun, but now it is. If you've, uh, if you've got some high stakes on this meal, what it means if you cook it poorly is not just I'm a bad cook, but because cooking is part of being a parent, now I'm a bad parent. And because being a parent is part of you know, being a human being, all of a sudden I'm a bad human being. And so obviously cooking may be a fairly disconnected example for that kind of thing. But when it comes to heavy ideas, when it comes to ideas that touch on how we live our lives and how we look at the world, like to, to be open to changing your ideas about how you look at the world is to be vulnerable to saying, you know, this part of my identity that I thought, uh, you know, was part of this overarching structure of, I want to be a good person or I want to be a competent person in the world. I want to have some meaning, you know, to, to be like, okay, I can, let me just unplug this little piece of it. Like that takes, that takes some courage. And I think that that's all the, that's why it's all the more important to not to to not be a jerk when you're trying to help people see ideas and to to help guide people but not to be forceful about it um, we talked with um anthony magnabosco and um i'm blanking on the other guy's name um ben diesel we talked with these guys who are what they call street epistemologists and the street epistemology approach is about taking a single topic, going out and having a conversation with someone on the street, a total stranger, and talking about things from a totally epistemological approach where you're not beating them over the head with facts. You're not telling them anything. It's, it's very Socratic. You're asking questions. You are uh, essentially saying to them, like, look, I don't know if your idea is right or wrong, but how important is it for you to find out? And when you approach it from that way, people tend to be a little bit more open and you can do that with yourself. And that's, that's what we try to model with the switch is being open. Excellent. Now let's open it up to questions. Um, so folks, uh, we have four rules for questions. Uh, number one, uh, raise your hand when you have a question. You can do that by either typing a question uh, in the chat or typing exclamation mark or raising your hand in Zoom. There are three ways of doing that here. Number two, keep on topic. We're talking about the switch. Uh, we're talk, talking about this idea of switch. So uh, you can bring anything connected to that. Number three, be brief so that we can get as many questions in as possible. And number four, be courteous. Feel free to disagree with anybody on anything, but do so courteously. All right. Uh, Joe, you're next. Go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks, guys. Thank you for sharing your journey. Um, it's uh, inspirational and it is helpful, and uh, it is something that is really beneficial for others. I there's a, I could ask you a hundred questions, but I, I, the one that I kind of have to ask is that how did your research on free will uh, in impact your uh, opinion on an, on an individual's ability to change? Personally, I felt um, like it became more of a group thing, change. And the interdependence on everybody around you, I began to see the importance of that because I didn't just think somebody could conjure an idea out of their mind like I would have thought before, I think. So I felt almost like I gained or needed to take on more responsibility to try to be, you know, respectful and effective in helping people to ask questions. And, and that's really what I feel like my biggest thing is. I just try to ask people questions. And if I think somebody's might be kind of off the rails with something, I'll try to just ask them questions about what they think about things and try to help guide them. And that's what I'd like other people to do with me because I, I do think it's hard for people, you know, kind of like uh, combining a lot of the stuff we've talked about. I think it's hard for people to kind of let go of things unless they feel like they figured it out. 
but so just to try to help them get to the right situation, whether it's around the right type of people that they want to get to, but they can't understand or they want to change. But yeah, more in interconnected. Uh, Chase, you want to add anything? Nope. Well, that, that, was, that was a good answer. Okay. okay. We'll Excellent. probably do a full um, episode on free will at some point. Okay. Uh, so next is going to be Raghav and then uh, Wesley. Raghav, go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, thank you for sharing everything that you did. Uh, there's one thing I wanted to ask you about, and I believe Alex had brought this up a little bit before about how uh, wrestling or, or some uh, activity that started to change his life. And I suppose the central question I'm trying to ask here is, uh, to what extent do you think that us, you know, reading philosophy or, or things like that affects us? And to what extent does like, you know, going for a run or, or doing jujitsu or uh, just, you know, asking a girl out on a date or taking those uh, actionable risks. And I know there's no exact percentage you can give me, but it's just in my experience that um, I've only found the former to, to be helpful to me so far. And I'd like to be able to learn from reading or from hearing podcasts, like from gentlemen like yourself. So I think I can answer at least part of that using just examples that you stated. I, I honestly think like I subscribe to this mind body idea that like it, it's, it's only a heuristic to talk about the mind and body separately. So, you know, you can talk about something like reading philosophy and that's, that's fairly center, centered around the sort of internal processes. Um, and you can talk about something like weightlifting or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, which is a, an awesome cross between sort of the intellectual process and the pure physical process. And even if you're just looking at the physical effects on your body, something like weightlifting releases hormones that are neuro, uh, neuro effective, uh, substances, right? So you can't get away from the connection between mind and body. Um, I think that if you're, if you're not looking at that whole picture, you're doing yourself a disservice. Uh, and you're only, uh, there's a, a great quote that, I know our friend John would be able to pull out right now, but uh, it's something like no man has the right to live life without understanding the extent to which he can grow. And I, I, I'm on board with that. It, practically, what I do is basically just make time allotments for everything and try to make sure that I get everything. And even if I don't want to, like uh, read or listen to a podcast I just well this is my hour block to do that and you know it always happens where I gain something from it you know or, or the way around like I'm really in the philosophical type of mood today and I've been listening to podcasts for three hours but I have my gym scheduled so I'm gonna go and after that I feel better and I feel like as I've learned to find balance I become intuitively aware of when I start to lack balance so i'll start to feel i'm very sensitive to any fluctuations if i don't meditate for like four days i can i have a different feeling you know or if i don't work out for four days i can tell and it's just because of that kind of consistency and awareness and paying attention to how each of these activities or states affect my how i'm feeling um what kind of thoughts my mind is bringing up or letting go of it's it's become easier and you know like you mentioned like habits you know it's it just becomes like that um i will add uh two two things because we always do this syntopical kind of um analysis where we bring in try to bring in ideas of everybody so one i want to quickly go through uh, carl jung's ideas on this and ray dalio's ideas on this so carl jung talks about psychological functions so some of your functions are stronger than the others. So those are the places where you're strong, it is easy for you to do things. And places where you're weak, it is harder for you to do things. But uh, so it is good idea to double up on your strong, strong things, but it's also a good idea to pay some attention to improving your weaknesses. That's going to be hard, but 
even if there is a small improvement in that, percentage net gain could be quite high. Similarly, um, Ray Dalio talks about it in terms of strength and weaknesses of saying that, you know, how, how do you work with your um, strengths most of the time, but how do you work with your weaknesses? So one of the ideas that he has is that you work with people who are stronger on those things. So you kind of have a partnership where the other person is stronger on this. And just by being around them through imitation, you learn something, they actually can help you on some things. And by watching all of that, you can improve your weaknesses a little bit. So those, those are the two things I wanted to bring up. So now it's going to be um, Wesley and then um, Jeff. Wesley asked me to ask the question uh, to you guys. Um, the question goes, if one person in a group of 10 changes, how does the person handle the ongoing changes in 10 person's reaction to him? Will that one person ever reach a point where there is no need to handle 10 person's changes? So I, I'll rephrase it if you want. I mean, what, what he's saying is that um, when you change, you, you are with a group of people. They were all in one place. You changed. They did not. They have an adverse reaction to you as a result of that. How do you handle that? I, I guess it depends how resilient that change in you is to other people's opinions and you know how valuable both the group of people are and that change is. You know, there's... Yeah, I, 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 for me, it's hard to make a generalization about that, I'd say, you know, I'd say for certain things that are really like life changing, like, you know, we did a podcast interviewing someone about addiction. And for him, that was basically life or death to just need to leave, you know, that was black and white, you know, to leave that group and find new people to be around and, and people who will encourage sobriety, you know, whereas if it's, you know, so you stop playing RPGs, you know, and somebody, you know, your friends are unhappy about it. You can probably work a way around that, you know? Yeah. So there's this idea. I, I don't know what the formal term for it is, but um, it has to do with association. And, you know, the common version of it is, oh, you're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Uh, I think that's an oversimplification. I think that's true, but I think that you're a sum of a lot more than that in terms of social influence. And when you make a change that people around you have some sort of adverse reaction to, uh, I think it's important to gauge why you're in proximity to those people uh, and how much influence you want to let them have on you. Uh, I think it's worth, if it's, if it's like the worst case scenario, uh, you know, we, we talked to a, a YouTuber, Theremin Trees, who, uh, you know, his big thing now is all about, um, you know, he talks about the negative forces of influence in social situations, like abusive relationships and things like that. Uh, and, it, you know, if that one in 10 example is an example that's that severe, uh, or something like the addiction example. Yeah, like the solution isn't figure out how to deal with the, the 10 people around you who can't deal with your change. It's pick a new 10 people. Um, but if it's something where you have the possibility of influencing those people as well, I think it's, it's all the more important to try to integrate that. It, yeah, it just depends. Uh, hopefully that was an okay answer. Uh, let me just add one thing, you know, uh, Wesley is from Singapore, and I know that the cultures, the Asian cultures are very different. Like, for example, I know from India, you know, in India, this, this social context is far more powerful than the American context. American context, there is a greater degree of freedom, greater degree of value placed on the individual, which is not the case in many of the social things. So, so these, the scale of the problem on, on this issue can be quite different from culture to culture. I just want to notice but the points still remain the same, but I think the scale of it is, is different. Uh, Jeff? I don't want to bring us too off track, but I do have a funny story about that for later. Please. No, no, go ahead. No. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So um, some friends of ours are Chinese Australian and um, the, they were in, where were they? Somewhere between, 
China and Australia. So it could have been, you know, Singapore, Pacific Island, somewhere. And they were seeing, uh, I think it was one of the like new Avengers movies or something in, I think it was Singapore. So they go into this theater and someone in the beginning of the movie stands up, asks the ushers to stop the film and turn on the captions. And they do it. Just one person stands up and says that. And they stopped the film completely, turned on the captions, rewound it like the whatever, 20 minutes and started it over. And like, you think about the way that that would go down in America. Like if, first of all, if they even stopped the film and did that, there would be outrage. Every single person would be asking for a refund. It would be on the news. It would be terrible. But in Singapore, everyone sat through it. And I can't remember the full extent of the story. I think there was one more incident, but they ended up uh, spending like an extra two hours in the theater to see this film because they were turning captions on and off and doing things like this. And everyone just accepted it. Um, it was just part of the, the, the culture to, you know, it was more important to accept it socially than, uh, you know, something like the, the American sense of, you know, righteous indignation about you can't stop my movie. I paid for this. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Next up is uh, Jeff. Jeff, go ahead. Uh, folks, if you have any more questions, just go ahead and line up. Otherwise, as soon as uh, Jeff is done, we are going to uh, go to breakout rooms where, uh, you know, Chase will be in one room and Alex will be in another, another room and you'll be able to ask them questions in a much more free flowing way. Uh, Jeff, go ahead. So uh, congratulations guys on really, you know, uh, creating this wonderful vehicle. Um, I, I have a question for you that's been part of my experience and just in the last month where I've been um, uh, a trainer for various teams where there were people in those teams who, who disagreed vociferously with my own perspective on things. And um, in both of these cases, they were political disagreements uh, regarding Sanders and, and Trump. And because what I was there to do with those teams was to facilitate their uh, envisioning different ways that they might move forward as a group in order to make some pretty tough decisions regarding who they were gonna be and what they were gonna do and how they were gonna spend their money and their time and all that. It was kind of a, an, uh, an environment that was rich for sharing really uh, diverse and in even opposing views for what they should do. And what we found in both cases with uh, kind of a, a base uh, focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, that the act of co-creating, the act of uh, collaborating to create something that was slightly different from what any of us thought to start was a little bit like discovering fire. It was a little bit, um, we weren't kind of just persuading each other. We weren't uh, any, you know, kind of one of us changing their perspective and agreeing with the other. We were actually creating new ways of looking at, at things and making decisions about them that were pretty consequential. Um, and all of us, all the views of, of most of us in the room were influenced, uh, if not switched in some way. And I wonder if, if you ever go through that experience with the folks that you're interviewing that maybe they realize something that they didn't, you know, they, they start to think about it differently just by being asked the questions you're asking them, as well as you being influenced as well as your listeners by uh, what's going on in the conversation. One time I, I know specifically, well, first of all, thanks for the question. And I, I've noticed that with myself, one of the most important experiences was actually with a team of like a athletic uh, individuals in college and the kind of bonding experience and ability to all discuss ideas that we all had slightly different takes on and to create something that we all agreed to, you know, types of workouts or just team philosophy was like a huge turning point for me. And it, it felt like one of the like ultimate, like uh, forms of human connection. You know, it's, it's like you said, it's almost feels like discovering fire. It's a, 
a great new discovery. Um, but one time in, sp- in particular with our podcast was in that same secular Buddhism episode I mentioned, um, my girlfriend actually came in and asked a much more personal question to um, the guy we were interviewing, Noah, and he really thought about it for a minute and responded. I can't quite remember what it was, but he actually went and did a podcast episode on it that next week on his podcast. And it was just, it was really interesting to see that flow of personal experience from one person, from me to her, to her, to him, to him, to his audience, and to see those kind of connections form and even just creating good relationships with these people and having a good time, you know, talking with them. Uh, somebody that, you know, I've looked up to too is it's a great feeling. And, you know, I'd encourage anybody to do that. One of the things we had to do it was we had to ask everybody to take their ideas and put them on the shelf and see if it was possible for us to come up with a perspective that might be better than what any of us could have come up with alone. And the, the name we, we gave it um, was uh, Collaborative Reinvention. And we're sure we didn't think about that. You know, we didn't create that name, but it's certainly what uh, is what we felt like we were doing. I like that. Chase, do you have any other recollections of a time that that happened or, or something similar? I was trying to think. I, I have my list of our episodes to just help us help me uh, remember specific experiences, but I can't think of any um, other instances in particular where that happened. Okay, uh, so uh, next, what we're going to do is we're going to go into breakout rooms. Um, but Chase and Alex, this is delightful. I'm delighted to have you guys as a regular feature uh, every Monday. Uh, and we're looking forward to having a new author, a uh, new person being interviewed. Uh, and the next one is going to be me. And I'm going to, you know, uh, we're going to focus on my transition from trying to learn by myself which I've done for many, 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 many years, decades, to the, this new mode that I moved to about four years ago of doing that in a social context with other people as a default. So moving from learning by myself to learning with other people. So that's what uh, the next episode is going to be about. And that's going to be next one day at 9 p.m. Chase? Awesome. Uh, yeah, before we depart, uh, if anybody is not sticking around for the small groups, if you want to find the switch, you can find it on any podcast platform, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever. The logo looks like this. It's very easy to find. It stands out. Um, yeah, thank you all for, for being a part of this. Oh, and in two weeks, we will be talking with Amanda Falk, who is the, um, she's a, a co-partner, she's a partner at the dorm, which is a sort of hybrid inpatient, outpatient mental health facility in New York City, dealing with COVID and trying to help treat patients. We're gonna be talking all, all sorts of cool stuff with her. Alex, any last words? Uh, I mean, thanks everybody for being here and listening, asking questions um, and great questions too. So thank you. Excellent. Again. And, and let's continue this in the breakout rooms. So uh, you'll get a notification. You just move to the breakout rooms right now. <laughs>